Hello guys, in this video I take this racket that I impulse purchased and I cut it down half an inch. And in the process of doing that, I break down a lot of observations about the craftsmanship of making tennis rackets with a focus on some surprising quality control discrepancies that are common across pretty much every tennis racket, not just Wilson, also Yonex. Not to say Yonex's quality control isn't better, I would say that it generally is. I'm just saying that there are certain practices and standards that seem to be pretty universal across the tennis tennis manufacturers in general. So I'll talk about that and I'll show you a hilarious example of something that was very surprising to find on this tennis racket. You'll see. But I also discuss the relationship between swing weight and length and stability. And I talk about the dilemma of extended length rackets, which is something I've really just never seen talked about before. I'll also show you guys why these grommets are so interesting. And if you ever want to, how to cut your own racket down, how to remove the butt cap, how to reinstall the butt cap. So this video functions both as somewhat of a tutorial, but also a commentary and observation on craftsmanship of tennis rackets. This is definitely my longest video, but hopefully you watch the whole thing. And if you do, you're a true fan and I really appreciate you, but whatever you stick around for is all good. So without further ado, let's get started. Oh, and the whole video is recorded on my phone because I had to move the camera around a lot. I wasn't trying to do that with my DSLR. All right. Woo. What's up guys? I just impulse bought a Blade 102. It's the Serena Blade Racket. It comes at 28 inches. It's an 18 by 19, 102 square inch head size. Kind of a funky racket. And the swing weight stock form is really high actually. Strung, this should be about 350. But this racket ticks a lot of very particular boxes of preferences I've acquired recently. So if you've seen my content, most recently I talked about parallel drilling and then I talked about crooked crosses. And this is one of the few rackets that actually has both and addresses all of those issues, both by having small grommets and parallel drilling. This racket has so many details that I really look for in a tennis racket that I just had to try it. And it's also extended length, which means I can cut it down to be whatever length I want. Even if I decide to cut it all the way down to 27 inches, that's fine because this is still a pretty rare racket. I mean, how many rackets are there out there that are parallel drilled with small enough grommet holes to fix any crooked cross issue that you might see? That's also a 102 head size with an 18 by 19 string pattern. I like my string patterns a little bit more dense. And secretly, this racket is somewhat of a platform racket, especially if you cut it down. And I'll explain that in just a second, but it kind of has to do with the dilemma of extended length rackets having a superficially high swing weight. But I think there is a good chance I can at least get this racket to be something I play really well with. But I don't think there's any way I'm gonna like it at the stock length of 28 inches. So before I really get into this video, I just wanna tell you what I plan to do as I record here. I wanna show you guys how I'm gonna cut this down to length with some basic enough tools that some of you might have. I have a clamp here, I have another clamp here. I have a saw guide that's actually clamped down to this table here, and it's just a portable table. It's not even that stable, but it's fine. I have a drill, I have a staple remover, I have another butt cap in case I wanna use it, and I have some micro drill bits. These drill bits are about the same diameter as an industrial staple is which are the staples the factory would typically use to staple a butt cap to the handle of a racket, which we're gonna remove in order to cut this. So I'm gonna show you and talk about how to do all that, but I also wanna talk about the swing weight dilemma with extended length rackets for just a second. So imagine you have a racket, it's standard length, 27 inches, and its swing weight is 300 units of swing weight. That's very light. If you know anything about swing weight, then you know that a racket that is 300 is gonna be very, very light. It's gonna be super easy to swing, but it's not gonna have good plow through. It's not gonna have any good stability. And one of the first things that any semi-serious tennis player would wanna to do to that racket is either throw it in the trash or put a bunch of lead tape on it, especially around the head area. However, what if I told you there was another way to increase the swing weight? by extending the length of the racket. So generally, every quarter inch that you extend a tennis racket, the swing weight will increase by about 10 to 12 units. And that's from personal experience. So let's just say 10 to keep the math easy. So let's say again, you have that racket, it's 300 units of swing weight. If you extend it a full inch, that would be 40 units of swing weight you have added to that racket, right? And now the swing weight's a lot higher. It's 28 inches, you're playing with a swing weight of 340. However, the swing weight is only higher because you've extended it. Is it actually any heavier? 
Not necessarily. So if it's not actually any heavier, but the swing weight is high, how is a racket like that gonna feel on volleys? It's actually gonna feel less stable because the racket is now further away from your hand and it's not any more stable. It doesn't actually have any weight. It's just harder to swing now because it's longer and therefore the swing weight numbers are higher. You haven't actually done anything to stabilize the racket. And that brings me to my point of why I'm cutting this racket down. This racket actually has about 350 units of swing weight. So it's not that far off from our hypothetical 300 swing weight racket. So I already know, and I've tried these rackets a bunch of times. If you've seen me follow my channel over the course of however long I've had it, this is a racket that I've danced around with several times for different reasons. And it's interesting how many times I've come back to this racket. And recently, again, it's that whole parallel drilling, crooked crosses, preference, everything has brought me back to this racket once again, but also because I still kind of want a slightly extended length racket. But I appreciate how funky this is. 18 by 19, 102, I already told you all that. I just want something a little weird. But this 350 unit swing weight racket is not gonna be stable enough. It's just gonna be hard to swing. And in pretty much every other way, it's gonna feel like a 310 swing weight racket, despite the fact that it's so hard to swing. In other words, this racket is a lot of work for no reason. The only actual benefit really is that you have an extra inch of length. And I don't think that an extra inch of length is ever gonna make up for how much harder it makes the racket to swing. But I don't wanna pretend like there are no benefits to the length. I mean, more reach is a nice thing, but you have to draw the line somewhere. At some point you've stretched out the racket too far and you have to make it too light for it to be useful anymore. So we're gonna cut this down and I think I'm just gonna start out by removing a half inch. I don't think there's any way in which I'm gonna be happy with this racket at any length longer than 27 and a half. So we're gonna go ahead and just take a half inch off of here. We're gonna see what that does to the swing weight numbers. And I'll show you how to do that. We'll take off the grip, we'll take off the butt cap, and then I'll show you how I go about cutting my rackets. With some basic tools, this is not expensive. We're not using any power tools here. Again, this is a great tutorial if you wanna do a kind of sketchy, but totally good enough job with some basic tools you might already have around the house. And if you don't, honestly, maybe 20 bucks or so at Lowe's, Home Depot, etc. unless you don't have a power drill, but these aren't very expensive either. And the power drill is actually not necessary unless you want to staple the racket really well. Maybe I should say this later in the video, but the butt caps are stapled with an industrial staple usually. I have never found a staple gun, a manual one, to be strong enough to penetrate through all the layers of the butt cap and the handle. Some people glue the butt cap back on. I don't want to do that. Some people do a mediocre job with the staple gun. I don't want to do that. So me having these micro drill bits and the power drill is so that I can drill pilot holes, which are really tiny holes that the staple will essentially fit into. And I'm just going to hammer the staples in after that. And that's always, always been really, really good for me. Anyway, let's go measure the swing weight of this strung racket before I take a half inch off so we can see what it did. It's strung with some sin gut that I'm just gonna cut out when I'm really <laughs> ready to hit with this thing. But for now, we'll do a little before and after with whatever's in here. All right, so we got the 104 in my graffiti swing weight tool. By the way, that 350 number I gave you guys, that's basically what the tennis warehouse average is. So we'll see what this one actually is right now. Any guesses? I'm gonna guess like 351. Oh, 341, okay, so this one's actually a little bit under spec. Those tennis warehouse measurements are not always clear about what string they use. So that could be a variable, but a swing weight that varies from 340 to 350, that's totally, totally normal in my experience. Honestly, if you just have another gram or so up in here or not in here, that would totally make a difference of 10 units in swing weight. I'm just gonna do one more measurement to get an average of three measurements. Yeah, so we're getting about 342 here, that's cool. For the record, if I put a dampener in here, that would probably bump that number up to 345. And if I strung it with a polyester string, it would probably bump that up to 350. Just some fun facts from my experience stringing and measuring so many different kinds of rackets. Anyway, let's cut a half inch off of this thing, shall we? All right, guys, before, or I guess as I'm taking off the grip, huh, here's the price tag, it was 159 bucks. I bought this racket from Courtside Tennis, the shop that I work with. They had a customer that I guess bought this racket and then didn't like it. So they returned it and then Quartzide decided to sell this at a pretty big discount and it's in basically new condition. And me having 
dabbled with this racket so many times. I think it's just better if I buy one and keep it around. That way, if I ever get curious with the racket again, I can just mess around with it again. But 159, that racket's kind of a steal and I actually get a bit of a discount. So it was an even better deal for me. And I had issues with my Wilson Shift, which was returned to me on store credit. So I pretty much just used that for a partial exchange that paid for this racket and I still have credit left. So that's why I bought this. I just couldn't say no. Anyway, as I'm peeling off the grip, which would be step one to cutting the length down, I wanna say something about craftsmanship on tennis rackets. So when I was a wee young lad, I used to think that tennis rackets were some kind of masterpiece craftsmanship work. And I'm not saying that they're not actually, but there are so many details about a tennis racket that are kind of sketchy. And my point is that yes, a lot of work and labor and meticulous detail, if you will, goes into manufacturing most of the racket. Everything from drilling the holes, designing the drill pattern, the carbon fiber layups and all the angles at which they intersect and all that depending on the racket, etc. There is a lot of technical craftsmanship happening on the manufacturing level of this racket. But my point is that despite all that, they still just slap on a plastic butt cap and then staple the heck out of it. To the point that actually, if you remove this trap door, I'm pretty sure that you could just see staples like jamming through the handle, which seems kind of like janky, right? Anyway, that's just one thing of many things regarding tennis rackets that are surprisingly not professional, as you would think. And the reason I'm telling you that is because as somebody who is kind of an obsessive perfectionistic type, I used to be totally intimidated doing any kind of jobs like this. But after realizing how hacked some of the jobs are, I started to feel like, oh, I could do that. Which is why I'm comfortable cutting down this racket with a saw and a saw guide with a couple of clamps on a card table and reattaching my butt cap with a drill, which I'll hammer the staples in. I'm not even gonna staple my butt cap. I'm actually like hammering the staples in. You'll see when I get there. Oh, uh, the tape is bunching up super weirdly because it's removed, it's separating from the grip so weirdly. I'm just gonna cut that so I can continue peeling. Funny, I don't even have scissors. I didn't think I'd need scissors for this job, but let's see. Ah, oh, there we go. Look, it comes off so nice now. I'm probably not gonna reuse this grip. I'll probably put Something else on, we'll see what I do. Sometimes I do some funky stuff for the grips. And there we go. Remove that last layer of tape. You can tell that the grip is factory because it's stapled down at the end here with a different staple than the other ones going in to anchor the butt cap to the handle. Anyway, you're just gonna kind of pull that out carefully. If you're lucky, sometimes you can remove the staple with the grip, but usually the grip's gonna come out and be kind of damaged on the end. If you wanna reuse the grip, be a little more careful about how you take it off. You know what? This is a perfect example of the lack of professionalism and craftsmanship that I'm talking about on this racket. So, okay, I'll get back to the butt cap part, but look at this, this is too funny. There is literally a hair molded into the handle of my tennis racket, you see this? And it's stuff like this that I see that made me think, you know what? It's actually not that crazy. Is this a hair? I hope it's not like a spider leg from a daddy long leg, look at this. See that, it's molded into the handle. Yeah, it's probably somebody's hair. Yeah, wow, no joke, huh? There we go, I broke it off. Anyway, it's just in there. It's just gonna be in there forever. Amazing, I'm really glad that that happened because that's just, that's a new example to me. I've never seen a hair in the mold of a racket handle. Are you kidding me? That reminds me of like getting a hair in, <laughs> in your meal at a restaurant and you complain and get a free meal. Can you imagine if I complained to Wilson and got a free racket? A good comeback from Wilson would be like, are you eating the racket? <laughs> but I think if a hair can make it to and through quality control, a lot of things can make it through quality control. I wonder if somebody saw their hair get in there and they're just like, ah, we're gonna, we're just gonna put a grip on it. No one's gonna notice. Unless time for tennis gets his hands on them, right? Oh, Wilson. All right, so we are down to the bare handle with a piece of hair and the butt cap and staples. So we're gonna ignore the hair. It's actually a souvenir. I wanna protect it at all costs. I mean, it's probably someone's hair from China. These rackets are manufactured in China. It's so weird. <laughs> it's gonna be like the weirdest kept secret of this racket. Anyway, the next step here is to remove the staples. I don't know what they use at the factory. Either way, it's a lot stronger than what I have, and therefore it is very, very in there. This is an industrial staple remover. That might sound really fancy or expensive. It's not, it's just a strong staple remover. It's gonna be a lot thicker than office staple removers, which kind of, they look flimsy. This does not look flimsy. Anyway, we're gonna start with the small one that was attaching the grip. Just gonna get one end up on it. 
like that and just yank it off a little bit. All right, that one's gonna come out with my fingers now. There we go. This one's really stubby and short. As for the other ones, they're probably just gonna take a little bit more work. Now, when you're doing a hack job on anything, it's important to be careful. Like, take your time and don't rush things. Obviously, this isn't maybe the best way to do it, but it's kind of a hard job to do. It's kind of like surgery. Sometimes you just can't find a comfortable angle to do the job, and you just gotta work with the angles you have. But I think the safest way to do it is to have the butt cap facing down, and that way when I'm pushing into the staples, I'm pushing it away from me. Whereas if I'm holding it like this, there's a risk of it slipping and jamming into my hand. Now, I'm not saying I've never done that because sometimes it's hard to get the staple out from this angle, but be aware of the risks of whatever you're doing. This is just a patience game now. So you see how once you get under a staple, you kind of leverage it, right? So I don't want to actually get to this point and then push too hard off of the handle because this polyurethane handle will dent. So if you care about that happening, maybe find a different angle where you can leverage off of the butt cap like this, right? That's what I was doing earlier. This is probably a little safer. I can kind of come at a different angle. My arm's all the way over there. Here we go, I think this one's up now. Yes, careful, careful, there we go. All right, that's one off. Cool, second one. Sometimes you just gotta get under it from one side and then get under it from the other side and then come back and then it'll actually lift. Don't worry if this takes a little while. I'm editing this video, so I mean, it looks like it takes a couple seconds, but some of these might take like 30 seconds, maybe even a minute. And that's okay, take your time, don't get hurt, don't damage your racket. You can also use a dowel. Most people stringing rackets have a dowel around. Wow, that really flung out of there. You should probably have safety glasses. I should probably have safety glasses. <laughs> but at least I said so, right? We got two of the four main staples out. Yeah, it'd be easier to get them out from that side actually, but I don't wanna damage the handle. Yeah, so you keep slipping and then hitting the handle. Good thing my hand's not there, right? Unfortunately, you always have to go into the butt cap a little bit to get under these staples. But I feel like 95% of the time, if you're careful enough, you can totally reuse the butt cap a few times even. And even if you damage the area a bit around where the staple was, you can just make a new area to staple the butt cap. Maybe I'll try the flathead. Is that any better? Flatheads are always good to keep around for whatever, right? Yeah, this one's taking a little while. Should be lifted enough though. All right, you know, we're gonna put some sunglasses on because I am starting to apply enough force that if any tool breaks, I'd probably regret it flinging in my eye. Earlier, there really wasn't that much force, so I wasn't worried about it. But you guys saw earlier how that staple flung out. I'm also probably gonna get my face a little closer, get a better view. Yeah, this one's requiring a bit of extra work for sure. A bit of extra tender love and care. Yeah, there we go. A little tender love and care, that's all this one needed to release. All right, last but surely not least. I feel like this one might be a little bit easier. By the way, if you guys manage to do this without damaging anything at all, I guess I'd be surprised. It's not necessarily an easy job, and there's not really a great way to do it. It's kind of the difference between like having a screw and having a nail. When you need to get a nail out, you just have to yank it out. I mean, there's almost no other way unless you can hammer it from the other side. You know, it's funny that I say that now, maybe if I pop open the trap door, I could kind of tap it from the other side. Oh yeah, totally. Ha <laughs> ha. All right, I think that's actually gonna make this a little bit easier, huh? You guys wanna see what the inside of this looks like? I don't know if that lights up very well. Yeah, there you go. That's some of the imperfection that I'm talking about, by the way, craftsmanship. Basically, these rackets are manufactured as two tubes that align at the bottom and become the handle. And you can see that this line which divides them is not perfectly centered and it's not perfectly vertical either. Like this opening here is bigger than the opening here. And if you wanted to be a real whatever stickler about it, you could make some argument about how the flex in the handle is a little bit different on one side of it than the other because one side has a larger diameter than the other. So that's kind of my point. These things are not manufactured to perfection. All right, I'm just gonna wedge it up against that staple and try to push it a little bit. Does that do anything? I definitely don't want to leverage it against that handle flap thing down the center because that will surely break. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't really see myself getting much leverage to make a meaningful difference, but it was a cool idea for five seconds. Get that flat head in there, wedge it up a little bit. Every little millimeter counts. So again, take your time and be happy with the progress that you make because it all adds up. All right, this one should start getting lifted soon. It's a decent enough opening. Come on. Yes, I think that's out. There we go. Come on. 
Yes. Nice. All right. So that is all four staples out and that little grip stapler, that stubby little one. If any of these are in really good shape, like they're not bent too much or dented too much, you can reuse them. And I'm actually down to like five of my staples that I wanted to use. So if I can reuse any of these, I will. All right, that's nice. The butt cap came off. I was filming me just sliding it off, but I'm recording with my phone and somebody called me. So that got cut out. But let me show you some more craftsmanship details on the handle here. More details really to just appreciate for how relaxed things must be at the factory. You guys see these uh, flaps right here, right? Like this. That's the carbon fiber layer basically lifting off of the handle from getting stapled. That's exactly what that is. So it's technically damaged and the racket just gets sold to you like that. Also, you can see some corners or edges of I think the carbon fiber here kind of sticking into the polyurethane mold. Some of the things that are happening at the factory level, even on Yonex rackets, is kind of just like this. This is standard practice. However, the way that I drill rackets when I put staples back into the racket handle, this does not happen because I'm drilling a small pilot hole that creates a very tiny hole and it's slightly tinier than the hole the staple would create. So it's a very tight fit. It doesn't have to pierce through all the layers in one go. Anyway, more on that later. Next, we're gonna take a half inch off of this handle. All right, well, this part's easy. Now you're gonna measure a half inch or whatever length you wanna cut off. I wanna cut off a half inch. I feel like I'll end up cutting off more later, but whatever, let's start with that. That way I can compare it to the Blade 104, which is 27.5, and then this one will be also 27.5, but with slightly different specs, of course. So we're just gonna see what a half inch looks like and then put a little pencil mark there. I mean, I'm not gonna zoom in and show you guys how to measure a half inch. You guys should know how to do that. You're all big boys now. All right, I've marked a half inch. Now we're gonna set it in my little saw guide. It's good to clear the table off now. Definitely don't wanna have this power drill just chill in here waiting to tip over because this table will undergo a little bit of shaking. So I'm gonna take most of this off of the table. Set it down here for later. Okay, I think what is left on here is fine. I'm going to line up the handle at the half inch mark that I did with my pencil on my saw guide. Now keep in mind when you cut something with a saw, if you put it right on the line, it's gonna cut a little bit past that because the saw of course has its own thickness. You wanna get the outermost edge of the saw on the innermost edge of your line. And so for me, that would be right there. Yeah, that looks good. So notice when I lift this, there's a slight gap here. I'm gonna put this down here to help, help hold that in place. Just happens to be about the exact height difference. So that's perfect. Now in a perfect world, I'd have a couple of more clamps, but I have one clamp holding this down on this side, which is gonna be the side that's more likely to push away because on this side, I'll be holding the racket down. But to assist me to hold it in place will be this little clamp. This is a very basic clamp. Just kind of squeeze it and release. So I'm gonna squeeze that to here. There you go. And that in combination with your hand kind of holding things in place a little bit, you should be perfectly steady for a good clean cut. Now I'm not even using a hacksaw, I'm using a regular wood saw, but this is gonna be good enough to cut through the polyurethane foam, which is pretty soft, all things considered. The more difficult layer to cut is gonna be that carbon fiber. And you guys remember that vertical bar that goes down, that really thin vertical bar? You guys wanna take quicker cuts without too much pressure straight down. That way you don't shred the fibers too much. And if you guys wanna go ahead and wear a mask when you're doing this, that's not a bad idea. But personally, I'm not using any power tools that are flinging dust everywhere, and I'll be standing pretty far away, and this isn't gonna take very long. I'm personally not that worried about it. All right, let's start with the first cuts. Yeah, so it really only takes a few seconds to get through that polyurethane, and then you're gonna be down to the carbon. I actually have a phone call to take, so I'm gonna do that while I'm cutting this, which my friend is probably gonna love. And I'll turn the camera back on once it's cut. But just so you can see the workstation, here we go. Got that little block to fill that gap right here. It's about the same height. Got the clamp there and the clamp here. You guys can see the bottom of my table. It's just a card table, literally. 
And that is the incision. Look at that. We're also gonna be going into some clean material since this will be the bottom of the handle. There will be no staple marks to accidentally use a second time. All right, wish me luck. All right, the job is done. We have here the cut handle and the residual. You guys ever try to say two words at the same time? I tried to say the remainder and residual at the same time. It just came out like, yeah, it's not a word. Anyway, let me get that up into view for you. So yes, you can clearly see that damaged carbon fiber from the staples as I pointed out earlier. It's a clean cut. And here's the handle. Yep, clean cut. Don't really know what else there is to say, but there you have it. We have successfully removed a half inch from the handle. Now I might as well put, well, some of this stuff away. You guys wanna see what comes off? Okay, take a look. So that would be the powders of the polyurethane mold, and that would be the layup material. And I guess the next thing that I'll do is probably get on the floor for the hammering and drilling step of this video because I don't wanna be hammering anything on this card table. It's not durable like that. But yeah, this would essentially be the stage where we reattach the butt cap to the handle here. So that's gonna involve making pilot holes with the drill. I'll show you how I go about doing it. I think it's a pretty clever method of marking the butt cap so I know where to put the holes. Although if I reused the last butt cap, then I can just follow the holes that are already there. But maybe you wanna make some new ones for whatever reason. Like I said, you might have compromised the butt cap so much or something that you need to make new holes. So we'll see what I do. Anyway, cleanup time. All right, guys, I'm getting set up here on the floor. I found that staple that flung out earlier. That's definitely too bent. I guess if you're super determined to, you could probably bend it back with some needle nose pliers or something. I don't know, do I wanna do that? Nah, not worth it. I don't wanna encourage trying to salvage a staple too much either. I think you're just better off getting a new one or one that's already in better starting condition. All right, it's time to reinstall the butt cap. So something to be conscious of, if there is one way in which you know you like to hold the racket and you want your butt cap to be facing up a certain way, maybe make sure that the W is facing up if you want this one to face you. You know what I mean? Uh, this would be the time to be conscious of which way you want the butt cap to be oriented. So this is essentially just gonna slide back on, make sure it's nice and all the way slid on. Can even give it a little push, but I don't think that's really necessary. It's on there. Now I already have holes since I removed this butt cap before that I can use as a guide for my drill. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drill tiny holes where these holes already are and basically just create a hole for these staples to follow instead of trying to get the staple to pierce through all the necessary layers. Cause one, I don't really have a strong enough staple gun and two, I'm not gonna just try to hammer it with no guide. So I do highly, highly recommend getting a micro drill bit for this kind of job. And obviously you will want a power drill. All right, there we go, that's in there. Now this is only probably sticking out about a centimeter after it's all the way in my drill, but that's perfectly fine. I guess I'll get the camera lined up for this shot. So you guys see where these holes are already? I'm basically just gonna use my drill right where those holes already are. And while holding this butt cap in place, just because I don't wanna slide it out, I will drill. Here we go. You don't really need to go all the way in, maybe just go in like half a centimeter. Take your time. Now the other hole. So the first hole that I drilled didn't go all the way through the carbon fiber layer, and the second one did. Don't worry about that. Sometimes that can be kind of a good thing. That way the first layer is like semi penetrated, but not fully. And obviously when you're drilling the holes, try to go in as straight as possible, at least as straight as you want the staple to go in. Cause you want the staple to be perpendicular to the angle of the flare of your butt cap, right? Which I've achieved pretty reasonably well, as you can see. Okay, so now that it's lined up, I'm just gonna give it a couple of good taps. And you can see that I'm holding the butt cap here. I don't have it flat like this. If I hammer it like this, it's gonna wanna pull the butt cap away since there's a gap on the floor between here and here, right? So I'm gonna hold the butt cap down like this. I know my fingers are a little close, but I'm really not worried about hammering my finger. Just give it a couple of good taps, ready? All right, that actually failed. We're gonna pull that out and try again. This happens sometimes. Remember this step from a long time ago? 
I actually tried to reuse a staple here and maybe that wasn't the best decision. So I'm gonna try this one more time and we're gonna see if it was the staple being reused that wasn't the right idea or if I actually just need to fully drill that hole. Well, let's just go ahead and fully drill it. Let's, let's make sure that it's not that. All right, there we go. Give it a good tap. All right, that's in there. Now I'm gonna do this side, same thing. These staples kind of just pry off of each other. All right, here's a little pair of clippers, <laughs> kind of a strange clipper, but I'll just use this to sort of pry it open right here on the edge. There we go. That's not harming it at all if you grab it just right. So are these lined up? Yes. So you can test to make sure that hole fits right, and it does. So same thing, we're just gonna drill perpendicular to the flare of the butt cap. By the way, be a little gentle when you drill because these are so thin. If you're doing a low speed, do low pressure. And the second hole, line up the staple like that. Cool, that's good, that's great. You know the drill. If it's taking a little while, just let the drill bit cool down for a few seconds. Why is that one taking so long? I'm trying to think what's on this side that would make the carbon so resilient. You don't want to push too hard because these drill bits are kind of flexible. They're just so thin. All right, there we go. Just took a little bit more patience and time, that's all. Oh, funny, that one just went right in. I must have been down to the last fraction of a millimeter when I stopped before. All right. Take our little clippers here, clip right in there, just to wedge it out, line it up, give it a tap. Great, nice and flush, nice and secure. All right, last one. Make sure they line up. Yes. Yeah, this side one's taking a second, so I'll just let the drill bit cool down again. All right, the drill bit broke. I got a little impatient, perhaps. So that goes in the trash now. I wonder if that's gonna be hot. Yeah, it's very warped. Luckily, we have another one here. It's slightly thicker, but it's all we got. Really, you want it to be as small as possible, not as big as possible. But this one will be less likely to break. All good. That one went right through, and... I think we're almost through here. Nice. It's also possible that drill bit was worn out. I've used it for quite a few butt cap things. Line it up. Nice. It's still quite snug. And... Yes. There we go. All four are in. Now it's just time to decide what I want to do with the base grip. Gonna give my hands a little rinse. All right, guys, just for fun, let's measure it with no grip on the handle. Any weight added to the handle, especially across the whole length, makes an extremely, extremely minimal difference on swing weight. But we'll see what it is before and after I put a base grip on. So this number is the previous swing weight at the 28 inch length. I'm gonna do a new measurement here, see what we get. Should be like 322, maybe a little lower. Any guesses to what the swing weight will be? You gotta cash them in now. I'm gonna guess 317. Oh, I'm pretty good. But see, we have a 319. It's basically 320. Yeah, 319.94, that's basically 320. And that is very close to about 20 units of swing weight reduced. So there you have it. The difference is 22.11. That is without a base grip, but I can basically guarantee you that adding a base grip would only add maybe one or two units of swing weight at the most. But let's go ahead and do it. All right, we got some head hydrosorb on there now. I just had it lying around. Let's set a new measurement group and see how much that changes the swing weight. Virtually nothing. I mean, I'm not saying nothing, but it is 0.66 on the first measurement. Let's do two more. I'm just guessing, by the way, but I'm assuming that this grip probably weighs about 15 grams. So you can see that a difference of 15 grams in the handle, since we had nothing on there before, made a difference of... Yeah, 0.73 at the most. So not even a single unit of swing weight 
from adding 15 grams across the length of the handle. So you can imagine if I put a leather base grip on here compared to the head hydrosorb, very, very small difference in swing weight. Maybe it would have brought it up one unit, but I kind of doubt it. Anyway, there you have it. My Serena blade is now 27.5 inches instead of 28, and its swing weight is 320 as opposed to 342. And if we delete this middle measurement, let's see. Yeah, the difference is essentially 21.4. So it's funny, I had the example earlier of a 300 swing weight racket. If I cut the other half inch off of this racket, it'd be about 300, <laughs> wouldn't it? Ah, uh, it's good to be right. Anyway, what I think I'll do is hit with this racket as it is for now and see where I want to add some weight. Oh, you guys want to do a twist weight measurement? All right, we have the blade set up for twist weight measurement. Here's a trick question. How much does cutting down a racket half an inch affect twist weight? It shouldn't affect twist weight at all because we're measuring on this axis and any weight right down the center shouldn't affect twist weight at all. Kind of like how adding weight to the handle barely affects swing weight. All right, let's get those numbers. Any guesses to what the twist weight's gonna be? I'm gonna guess, I'm gonna guess 14.4. Let's see. I should be pretty good at this by now, just by eyeballing. Moment of truth, 13.62. Yeah, okay. Do one more. All right, there you have it, 13.66. And that's a number that would probably go up just a little bit when I string this up with a polyester string, but I'm not sure it would go all the way up to 14. I don't really have an exact twist weight number that I know I like. That's something that's always relative to the racket in a bunch of different ways. Anyway, after hitting with this racket and getting the tension dialed in, that's so important because the tension does affect how the ball gets pocketed and how the ball gets pocketed affects how the stability is. So I'm gonna get to know this racket as it is and we'll see where I want to add any weight, if any at all, I'm sure I will. And hopefully I can add weight under the grommets so that I can disguise it. I don't like having lead exposed on the hoop. Look at these grommets, by the way, they're pretty interesting, aren't they? You ever see anything like that? It's not on the typical blade. Only the 104s have it as far as I know. Pretty interesting, really small. The frame is drilled out in such a way that it allows for a little bit of string movement, but the grommet holes are very tiny. You can see that they're basically completely hugging the string. And I'm all about it. All right, well, thanks for watching. That was a bit of a different video. I had to move the camera around a bunch, so I wanted to film it on my phone and not my DSLR. So I hope you guys enjoyed this sort of vlog style video. Anyway, stay tuned. If you guys have any questions about anything in the content of this video, just leave a comment. And if you have any questions about this Serena racket, let me know. I'll be getting acquainted over the next few days. Oh yeah, one more thing. Don't forget to check out Restring Zero. I'm gonna be cutting these out soon and i'll be putting some real polyester strings in here because i want that snapback and i want that durability and nobody delivers like restring zero except for toro line with their string wasabi so toro line wasabi restring zero those are my top two recommendations if you want maximum top spin potential i can't recommend any string over those two and they work really good together in a hybrid great durability really good tension hold especially from restring zero but wasabi is a little bit softer so if you want a softer string you can put wasabi in as a hybrid with restring zero but if you like something a little more crisp you can go with zero but I really feel like it's hard to go wrong with either string. Give it a try. I have a discount code for you. You can get 10 to 20% off with my code at Time for Tennis, or you can just click the link below and the discount should apply automatically. Also check out my code for some other sponsors because I only endorse my favorite products that I also use on a daily basis. So if I'm repping it, I'm using it and you can get a discount with my code. Helps me out, helps you out. You get the point. All right, my arm's getting tired and I'm getting tired. <laughs> I'll see you guys in a future video. Thank you so much for watching. Happy hitting. All right, bye for now.